So I think this is a pretty tough question and it's very easy to get caught up with a lot of math, but if we believe that this is not a math test, then there should be a way to get to the right answer without doing almost any math at all, and that's what we'll see in this video. So I think the first thing we probably want to do as we're reading the question is see what are the actual profits per item for P and Q. So if I quickly subtract the cost from the selling price, I find that the profit per unit for P is $2 and the profit per unit for Q is $3.5. Now the total number of units sold is given, it's 834. And so uh, an executive would probably wonder, well, how much profit can I expect without knowing the mix of P and Q? And that executive would probably say, well, in the worst case scenario, all 834 units came from P. So that's $2 times 834, which is, I don't know, let's call it 1700. And in the best case scenario, all 834 units came from Q, so 834 multiplied by 3 and a half. Well, 800 times 3 is 2400, plus another half of 800, which is 400. I don't know, let's call it just under 3000, right? 28, 2900, something like that. So if I draw a number line between those extreme scenarios, so we've got on the one hand around 1700, and on the other hand around 2900, that's a total distance of 1,200 units. And the question itself is a yes-no question. It just wants to know, are we to the right of 2,000 on this number line that goes from about 1,700 to about 2,900? And the reason that I'm not worrying about the specifics is because I know that on a true GMAT question, I shouldn't need to do a bunch of math. And now I'm ready to evaluate the statements. So statement one puts us somewhere in the left half of this number line, in the bottom half, but knowing that I'm in the bottom half doesn't actually tell me whether I'm in the bottom quarter or the top three quarters. So I'm going to say that statement one is not sufficient on its own, and I'll eliminate the answer choices that claim that it is. So A and D are gone, and we're down to B, C, or E. Now, statement two tells us that there were at least 100 units of Q and I'm thinking if there were exactly 100 units of Q, that would put me a lot closer to the P side than the Q side, because then there would be, what, 734 units of P and only 100 units of Q. So that would definitely put me inside the bottom quarter. The problem is that it said at least 100 units of Q. So it's possible, based on statement two, that all of the units sold were Q, and that would give us a definitive yes. We would absolutely be in the upper three quarters. So statement two also allows us to either be in the bottom quarter or the top three quarters, and I'll eliminate answer choice B. Now what happens when we combine these statements? I'm to the right of the bottom one-eighth, I'm in the bottom half. Am I in the bottom one quarter? Or am I not in the bottom one quarter? I have no idea. So even with both statements combined, we still can't determine whether we're in the bottom third or in the top two thirds. And now I can confidently go ahead and pick answer choice E. If you found this video useful, go to quantreasoning.com for a lot more where that came from. You should also click that like button and let me know in the comments below what you'd like me to make future videos about. And of course, if you haven't yet subscribed, go ahead and do that and click that bell below so you get notified about future videos. See you next time.